Chapter 5, <clears throat> Diagon Alley. <clears throat> Harry awoke early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. I dreamed a, gi a giant called Hagrid came to tell me I was going to school for wizards. When I open my eyes, I'll be at home in my cupboard. There was suddenly a loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door, Harry thought his heart sinking, but he still didn't open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry mumbled, I'm getting up. He sat up and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa. And there was an owl wrapping its claw on the window, a newspaper held in its beak. <coughs> Harry scrambled to his feet. So happy, he felt as though a large balloon was swelling inside of him. He went straight to the window and jerked it open. The owl swooped in and dropped the newspaper on top of Hagrid, who didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. <coughs> Don't do that! Harry tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it snapped its beak fiercely at him and carried on, a, carried on savaging the coat. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, there's an owl. Pay him, Hagrid grunted into the sofa. What? He wants paying for delivering the paper. Look in the pockets. Hagrid's coat seemed to be made of nothing but pockets. Bunches of keys, slug pellets, balls of string, peppermint humbugs, tea bags. Henry, Harry, finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange looking coins. Give him five newts, said Hagrid sleepily. Newts? The little bronze ones. Harry counted out five little bronze coins and the owl held out its legs so Harry could put the money into a small leather pouch tied to it. <coughs> then he flew off through the, through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly, sat up and stretched. Best be off, Harry. Lots to do today. Gotta get up to London and buy all your stuff for school. Harry was turning over the wizard coins and looking at them. He had just thought of something that made him feel as though the happy balloon inside of him had got a puncture. Um, Hagrid? Hmm, said Hagrid, who was pulling on his huge boots, getting something in my mouth to help my throat. I haven't got any money. And you heard Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go and learn magic. Don't worry about that, said Hagrid, standing up and scratching his head. Do you think your parents didn't leave you anything? But if their house was destroyed, they didn't keep going. They didn't keep their gold in the house, boy. Nah. First stop for us is Gringotts, Wizard's Bank. Have a sausage. They're not bad cold. And I would say no to you. I would say no to you. Bit of birthday cake, neither. I wouldn't say no to you, a bit of birthday cake, neither. Wizards have banks? Just the one, Gringotts, run by goblins. Harry dropped the bit of sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah, so you'd be mad to try and rob it, I'll tell you that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything you want to keep safe, except maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I got to visit Gringotts anyway, for Dumbledore. Hogwarts business. Hagrid drew himself up proudly. He usually gets me to do important stuff for him. Fetching you, getting things from Gringotts. Knows he can trust me, see? Got everything. Got everything then. Come on then. Harry followed Hagrid out into the rock. The sky was quite clear now, and the sea gleamed in the sunlight. The boat Uncle Vernon had hired was still there, with a lot of water in the bottom after the storm. How did you get here? Harry asked, looking around for another boat. Flew. Flew? Yeah, but we'll go back in this. Not supposed to use magic now, I've got you. They settled in the boat. Harry's still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though, said Hagrid, giving Harry another of his sideways looks. If I was to uh, speed things up a bit, would you mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts? Of course not, said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid pulled out a pink umbrella again 
tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off toward the land. Why would you be mad to try and rob Gringotts? Harry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hangrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. They say there's dragons guarding the high security vaults, and then you got to find your way. Gringotts is hundreds of miles under London Sea, deep under the underground. You'd die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on some up. Harry sat and thought about this while Hagrid read his newspaper, The Daily Prophet. Harry had learned from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone while they did this, but it was very difficult. He'd never had so many questions in his life. Ministry of Magic messing things up as usual, Hagrid muttered, turning the page. There's a Ministry of Magic? Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They want Dum Dumbledore for minister, of course, but he'd never leave our warts. So old Cornelius Fudge got the job, bungler if ever there was one. So he pelts Dumbledore with owls every morning, every asking for advice. But what does a Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from the muggles so that there's still witches and wizards up and down the country. Why? Why? Blimey, Harry, everyone will be wanting magic solutions to their problems. Nah, we're best left alone. At this moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded up his newspaper, and they clambered up the stone steps onto the street. Passersby stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry couldn't blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone else, he kept pointing at perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, See that, Harry? Things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, said Hagrid. Crikey, I'd, be a, I'd like a dragon. You'd like one? Wanting one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes' time. Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money, as he called it, gave the bills to Harry so he could buy their tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted stitches. Harry took the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good, said Hagrid. There's a list of everything you need. Harry unfolded a second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read... Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First year students will require one, three sets of plain work robes, black. Two, one plain pointed hat, black, for everyday wear, for day wear. Three, one pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. Four, one winter cloak, black, silver fastenings. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. All students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshawk. History of Magic, by Batilda Bagshot. Magical Theory, by Adalbert Waffling. A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration, by Emmerich Switch. 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, by Philida Spore. Magical draft, Drafts and Potions, by Arsenius Jigger. Fantastic Beasts, and Where to Find Them, by Newt Scamander. The Dark Forces, A Guide to Self-Protection by Quentin Trimble. One wand, one cauldron, pewter, standard size two, one set glass or crystal files, one telescope, one set brass scales. Students may also bring an owl or a cat or a toad. <clears throat> Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered aloud. If you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before. Although Hagrid seemed to know where he was going, he was obviously not used to getting there in an ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier on the underground and complained loudly that the seats were too small and the trains too slow. I don't know how the muggles manage without magic, he said as they climbed a broken down escalator that led up to a bustling road lined with shops. Haggard was so huge that he parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep close behind him. They passed bookshops and music stores, 
hamburger restaurants and cinemas, but nowhere that looked like as if it could sell you a magic wand. This is just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. <clears throat> could there really be piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath them? Were there really shops that sold spell books and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known that the Dursleys had no sense of humor, he might have thought so, yet somehow, <clears throat> even though everything Hagrid told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The Leaky Cauldron, it's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking pub. If Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry wouldn't have noticed it was there. People hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slid from the big bookshop on one side to the record shop on the other, as if they couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most peculiar feeling that only he and Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered him inside. For a famous place, it, sh it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in a corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him, and the bartender reached for the glass, saying, The usual, Hagrid? Can't Tom, I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping his great hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord, said the bartender, peering at Harry. Is this, can this be? The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old bartender. Harry Potter, what an honor. He hurried out from behind the bar and rushed toward Harry, and seized his hand, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter, welcome back. <clears throat> Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs, and the next moment, Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky, leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr. Potter, can't believe I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter, I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand, I'm for all full of a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter, just can't tell you. Diggle's the name, Dedalus Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Dedalus Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. You bowed to me once, in a shop. He remembers, cried Dedalus Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward, very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p -p Potter, stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping at Harry's hand. C -c Can't tell you how p -p pleased I am to, to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? D -d Defense against the d -d -d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. Not that you need it, eh, P -P Potter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g got to p pick up a new b book on vampires myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took almost ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the babble. Must get on. Lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small, walled courtyard, where there was nothing but a trash can and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you you was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh, yeah. Poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but when he took a year off to get some first-hand experience, they say he met vampires in the Black Forest, and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students, scared of his own subject. Now, there's where's me umbrella? Vampires? Hags? 
Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the trash can. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled. In the middle of a small hole appeared. In the middle of it, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough for even Hagrid, uh, uh, an archway onto a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into a solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, said a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we gotta get your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once, the shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. A plump woman outside an apothecary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragon liver, 16 sickles an ounce, they're mad. A low, soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, Ilops Owl Emporium. Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown, and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against a window with their brooms with broomsticks in them. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes, and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens, eels eyes, and tottering piles of spell books, quills, and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building that towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold, was... Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly as they walked up the white stone steps toward him. The goblin was about a head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed them through the silver doors and they were on in the vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins and brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have his key, sir? Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid. And he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. It seems to be in order. And I've also got a letter from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing it out his chest. It's about you-know-who, what, in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take you down to both vaults. Griphook! Griphook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Griphook toward one of the doors leading off the hall. What's you know what in Vault 713, Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret, Hogwarts business, Dumbledore's trusted me. More than my job's worth to tell you that.
Rip Hoke hold the do held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marble, was surprised that they were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downward, and there were, uh, there were little railway tracks on the floor. Grip Hook whistled, and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks toward them. They climbed in, haggard with some difficulty, and were off. At first, they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember left, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Grip Hook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once, he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon, but too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never know, I never know, Harry called the haggard over the noise of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got an M in it, said Hagrid, and don't ask me questions just now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green, and when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees from trembling. Grip Hook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze knoots, knoots. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often they had they complained of how much Harry cost them to keep. And all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him, buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon and twenty-nine canutes to a sickle. It's easy enough, right? That should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Grip Hook. Vault 713 now, please, and can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled round tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine, and Harry leaned over the side to try to see what was down at the dark bottom, but Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Grip Hook importantly. He stroked, stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Grip Hook. Oops, that's Grip Hook, and I did Hagrid's voice. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside, Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Grip Hook with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault. Harry was sure, and he leaned forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but knew better than to ask. Come on back in this infernal cart and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One wild cart ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first now that he had a bag full of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd had in his whole life. More money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding toward Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slip off for a pick-me-up in the leaky cauldron? I hate them Gringotts carts. He did still look a, a, a bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Malkin's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Malkin was a squat, smiling witch dress, all in mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said, when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here, another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a pale, pointed face was standing on a footstool while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame Malkin stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a long robe over his head, and began to pin it to the right length. 
Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying my books, and mother's up the street looking at wands, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at, at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom? The boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all? No, said Harry again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house, and I must say I agree. Know what house you'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin. All our family have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the boy, suddenly nodding toward the front window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's sort of a servant, isn't he? He's the gamekeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of a savage. Lives in a hut on the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk and tries to do magic and ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you, said the boy with a slight sneer. Why, is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not, no, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and a wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let the other sort in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to our, know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine. I think they should keep the old wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame Malkin said, uh, That's you done, my dear. And Harry, not so sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid had brought him. Chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing, Harry lied. They stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed color as he wrote. When they had left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know, not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Malkins. And he said people from Muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a Muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he's grown up knowing your name if his parents were a wizard and folk. You saw what everyone in the leaky cauldron was like when they saw you. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the only ones uh, with magic in them of the long line of Muggles. Look at your mom. Look what she had for her sister. So what is Quidditch? Mm, we're going to have to stop here because it's noon and i got to eat before fourth grade meets. So we will stop here for today.